In this video, I'm going to introduce us to the idea of lattices. And so I'll start with 1D lattices and then kind of move up into two and three dimensional lattices. And so a lattice is something that is essentially just evenly spaced. So there's an equal amount of space between each point on the lattice. And so we can start with uh, our zero here. And then when we move from there to there, we're just adding plus a, and then when we move from here to here, we're adding plus A. And so the entire movement would be 2A. And so that's why this is labeled 2A, because we have gone two A's away from the origin, where A is sort of our our uniform uh, length. Uh, it's, it's our, well, it's our vector is what it is. It's a 1D vector of length a and therefore a is the group generator where we can define any point on this uh, as n a where n uh, is an integer an integer and so it, it could go from zero to plus or minus one uh, to plus or minus two and so on uh, and so addition is as i said so D, I use D for distance, so A plus A equals 2A, and more generally, MA plus NA is just equal to M plus N times A. Uh, we have an inverse uh, such that uh, we have A plus minus A, uh, and that just goes to zero, and uh, more generally, we have M plus N minus A is M minus N times A, and it's zero if M equals N, uh, and it is not zero if M does not equal N. And therefore, zero is our identity element uh, because this is just addition, and so zero is our identity element. Uh, so for each point, uh, we can replace them with some kind of two-dimensional, or I mean you could do three-dimensional object as well, but for this illustration we're looking at two-dimensional objects. Uh, so where each object by translation of n times a, where each of these objects is uh, a, a unit uh, apart a, distance a apart, uh, is brought into self-coincidence. So if you brought this one uh, ahead over here, it would just become in, it would just go into self-coincidence with that one. Uh, and so for this, uh, we can also add points. Uh, so we could add a point inside there or at some place between two of them, where now we could rotate the entire thing around 180 degrees and it would bring it once again into self coincidence with itself. Uh, and we can uh, do that with reflection points. So if we reflect across there or if we reflect it across there, it would bring the entire line into self coincidence. Uh, sort of assuming that this is an infinite line, which is why I put the dots on both sides. Uh, so we can add rotation and reflection points. Uh, and so when one such rotation or reflection point is fixed uh, as the origin, it can't be translated, then we have what's called a point group. Uh, and these have some, you know, some of these symmetry uh, objects here, some of these sym symmetry operations, which I actually discussed briefly in the first video on this series. So we can have rotations, we can have reflections, inversions, and these uh, improper axis of symmetries here, which is like a rotation plus an inversion, where the rotation uh, that you are performing is not a symmetry operation by itself, and the reflection is not a symmetry operation by itself, but both of them together become a symmetry operation. Uh, and so that's why the S sub N is itself a symmetry operation. Uh, so when we add translations, allowing us to sort of move uh, from one to the next, uh, then our point group becomes a space group. Uh, and so Space groups are, you know, things that we use, or at least that I've used when I've done like uh, x-ray crystallography and things like that. Uh, point groups are something that, uh, 
well, I don't know that I've ever used it in my work, but I, I learned about it in like an inorganic chemistry class. Uh, and so these point groups and space groups will be things we'll be talking about quite a bit in future videos. Uh, and so we, this is, you know, kind of our introduction to these ideas of point groups and space groups. Uh, so we extend this into two dimensions and three dimensions. So in two dimensions, we just have uh, two different of these A's here. And, you know, they don't have to be the same size. And as I show in this figure here, they also don't have to even be, you know, perpendicular to each other. We could have our A2 right here be uh, oblique to our A1 here. And in fact, if you do crystallography, this is going to be much more common than finding nice square uh, nice square unit cells here for your space group. Uh, so that's two dimensions. Uh, we could then add our, our point groups uh, or our symmetry C3V here to every point in the lattice. So here I've put uh, a triangle at every point in the lattice. And so, uh, you know, you could perform all your C3V operations on every point in this lattice. Uh, and of course, I put them on here small, but uh, if you were actually doing this, it would probably be, you know, something much, much bigger like this so that uh, each one is sort of touching the next one in line. And so uh, that would actually make it, you know, more lattice-like. But this this works just for an illustrative purpose. Uh, so just like in the 1D thing, we can add objects to it. We can do the same thing here in two dimensions. Uh, so in 3D, we just add uh, another one of these uh, units here. And, you know, you you may have already figured out that these are, you know, essentially like basis vectors uh, where these, the N, M and K here are our components. And so we have uh, up here the origin, which you can tell because the arrows are all pointing away from it. And so you can get to any point in this three-dimensional grid uh, by just uh, you know, going a certain number of A1s, uh, a certain number of A2s, and a certain number of A3s. Uh, and so that is a three-dimensional lattice. Uh, and so when we want to add two displacements, uh, so we have our V and W here. So, you know, say we wanted to add, you know, a displacement to here plus like a displacement to, you know, something way down here. Uh, you know, then we have to add it like this, uh, but then we want to rearrange it so that we're just adding up the uh, the components of the the A1 here times our A1, our components of the A2 here times the A2, and then the components of the A3 here times the A3. So it's just vector addition. Um, and so we can now formulate our rules for combining lattice vectors A, B, and C with the integers N, M, and K. So if A is in the group G, then so is M, A, uh, where M is some integer. Uh, so distributive and associative, so we take our, our two integers here times our our uh, lattice vector here, and then that's just equal to uh, one times our lattice vector plus uh, plus n times our lattice vector, and the same is true for multiplication. It's it's associative for multiplication for all a in our group G, and we have identity elements which uh, for multiplication is one, and for addition is zero. Uh, and we are distributive here uh, for all A and B in G here. We can therefore define a vector space uh, like this. So M over N, where M and N are integers. So just sort of any uh, arbitrary integer. Uh, and so we can also then add this R here, which uh, so essentially what I'm saying in all of this is that it gives us the irrational numbers. And so we can have all our rational numbers, which is any integer divided by another integer that gives us our rational numbers, the irrational numbers like the square root of two and the square root of three and pi and 
Euler's number and things like that. Uh, so when we add all those in, we get our real number line. And so uh, it becomes continuous. And we can therefore uh, sort of exchange out those M, Ns, and Ks for these Xs here, which can take on any real number value. Uh, and that'll give us a vector space. And we could even go further and add the real numbers times uh, times the square root of negative one, which is the imaginary number. And so we could get the complex numbers as well, which just expands uh, sort of our field of numbers uh, well, quite considerably more actually, but uh, but anyway, uh, this was you know just showing how we use these these lattices, which uh, you know form a group, and uh, we can just sort of expand on them until we get up to a vector space. And so the next few videos after this one, uh, I'm going to be talking about vector spaces. And uh, I've already made a, sort of a short playlist introducing um, introducing vectors. And so uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of, I don't want to say rush, but I'm going to move through them fairly quickly uh, because you know, it's essentially just background stuff that you need to know in order to do uh, the rest of the stuff, which is what I actually want to get to. But uh, I'll spend a few videos on on vectors and sort of go through it. Uh, you know, it, it, it should be good. Uh, I feel like if you probably are, you know, at, you know, zero knowledge of vectors, it might not be that helpful, but if you have even just like a little bit of knowledge of vectors, you could probably still follow along with it. But anyway, uh, I hope you found this video helpful, and I will see you in the next one.